Well, Matthew 25, the parable of the, the wise and the foolish virgins, I guess you, you know the text quite well, so we're going to just, uh, just plow through, but um, start off in Matthew 24, uh, the end of 24 there, we've got the, uh, the parable about the, the servant who, who smites his fellow servants and who doesn't provide for them as he should do. Verse 50, and the Lord of that servant comes in the day when he looks not for him, and in an hour that he's not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, so there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then we start, Matthew 25, verse 1, and then, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. So I think what, uh, what the Lord is saying is that the um, perception of judgment will then be clear, but then, in that moment, it will all be clear to us actually before, before the Lord's final judgment process, that then we will understand, that then we shall reflect upon the essence of what is here in the parable of the wise and foolish, that then it will be apparent to us who is wise and who is foolish, and what the basis of acceptability was with the Lord. And this is similar to something you've got in Malachi chapter 3, Verse 18, then shall you return and discern or judge between the righteous and the wicked. But who is the you? In the context there, in Malachi 3, like verse 14, it is those who have been asked to return or to repent, but had said, verse 7, wherein shall we return? What have we got to repent about? And then you, then you will repent, that is too late, and you will judge or discern righteousness and wickedness. And I think that that is very analogous to what we're reading here. But then, in that moment of judgment, just before it, then it will be clear to the rejected, those who repent but too late, uh, what is the essence of righteousness and what is the essence of wickedness. And of course, so many times in the Bible we read about God's word as his judgments. That his judgments, the basis upon which the day of judgment is going to be uh, worked out, is actually obvious right here and now. And insofar as we perceive that, the Day of Judgment doesn't hold some, some secret, some enigma to us, that in fact it's all clear and plain insofar as we understand God's judgments here and now. Now, you know how the story goes on with the wise and foolish virgins, some take oil in their lamps and uh, extra oil, whereas others don't take enough and their, their lamps go out. And then they, they run around at the end of it saying, oh, the bridegroom has come, so where is the oil, etc. And he says, I, I don't know you. You could, reading this straight on from the end of Matthew 24, you could argue that this is uh, a, a further explanation of the parable of the, uh, the selfish uh, leader of the household, the chief slave in the household, who does not actually provide for the household, but goes and eats and drinks for the drunken. As if the implication could be that because of poor leadership in the ecclesia, in the, in the church, in the, in the family, in the house of God, therefore some people will not have oil in their lamps and will be rejected. So, Matthew 25, verse 1, they go forth to meet the bridegroom, and he, he tarries, he, he delays, uh, verse 5, while the bridegroom tarried. Now, in fact, that's a, a, a word, a Greek word, that we've just uh, come across at the end of Matthew 24. Uh, but Matthew 24, uh, verse 48, 49, the evil servant says in his heart, my Lord delays his coming and starts to eat and drink with the drunken. And now in this parable here in Matthew 25, yes, that is the case. The Lord does delay his coming. So there is a delay. And it is that delay which leads people in the last generation, I think that's what Jesus is saying, in the last generation before the Lord comes, that is what leads people uh, into a state of unpreparedness. Because the Lord does delay. And when the evil servant says in his heart, my Lord delays his coming, that's correct. The Lord does delay his coming. That's the whole point of Matthew 25, verse 5, that the bridegroom does tarry, and they all slumber and sleep. He delays. Same word. 
So then there is a delay. And I think that's maybe why in the last generation or so, so many people have worked out wonderful fulfillments of prophecy and have said, and therefore the Lord must come. And at the time, of course, those interpretations of prophecy looked pretty good, but then the Lord didn't come when it seemed he should have come. And I think that that wasn't necessarily a failure in interpretation. It was simply that the Lord delayed. Of course, there are some wacky interpretations out there that, that clearly were, were wrong from the start. But the fact is the Lord does delay. Now, exactly why he does is another story, but you, you have a clue to it, I think, in the second of Peter 3, where Peter seems to be saying that the Lord delays because of his mercy. In other words, that he wants more people in his kingdom. And it's a, a paradox in a sense, because in another sense, if the Lord does not come earlier than he, he planned, then even the elect themselves would not be saved. And we pray for his coming to come, come quickly. And so, in a sense, we are on one hand uh, hastening unto the coming of the day of God, as, as Peter says, by a spiritual way of life, we can hasten that day's coming, and yet in another sense, it is delayed. So there's all these factors which, in the final algorithm, which only God knows, are all factored in to the, the actual calendar date, if you like, of, of the Lord's return. So then, they go out to meet the bridegroom. You could interpret that in verse 1 as meaning that when we're converted, we are all gung-ho for the Lord to come soon, and we go out to meet him. And so, when someone is baptized, when someone turns to the Lord, it's not as if, well, someday Jesus will come. Yes, he will come one day, but you go out to meet him. It's as urgent as that, that he is at the door. Now, quite independent of any interpretation of prophecy and trying to match current events against uh, certain Bible passages, putting that on one, one side for, for the moment, the point is that we go out to meet him as if his return is imminent. And I would say that that is almost a first principle of the, the true faith, that we are to go out to meet him, we are to, to live as if we expect his return to be imminent, as if. That is the spirit which should uh, be there in our lives. Wake up every morning, pray that he will come, thinking maybe this is the last day, L go to sleep at night thinking, well maybe that is the last time I set my alarm clock, maybe this is the last time I take my watch off, this is the last time that... I put my head down on this pillow, etc. Because one day it will be, for us, the last. So that intensity of expectation is, of course, very difficult to maintain. But I don't think we maintain it by comparing world events against Bible prophecy. Because we're likely to get that wrong. And in any case, the Lord may delay his coming, or he does delay his coming, uh, in any case. So the point is that we should be ready to go out and meet him because we love him, because we personally love him and want to be with him in his kingdom, and we can't wait to see him. So then, there's a delay. And then at midnight, verse 6, there's a cry made. The bridegroom comes, go out to meet him. And they start to think about going out to, to meet him. Now, trying to put all this together chronologically is almost impossible. Because in another teaching of the Lord about judgment, we are likened to sheep and goats that come before the, the throne of the Lord Jesus, which will be the re-established throne of David in Jerusalem, um, as if when he comes, uh, immediately he's enthroned in glory, and we come before him to be judged and separated between sheep and goats. Whereas here it seems to imply that uh, there is an element of choice as to whether we initially go to meet him. And also looking at this word meet, they go out to, uh, to meet him. This is the same word you've got in First Thessalonians 4 verse 17. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up or snatched away in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 
Now, there's a lot of connections between the end of Matthew 24 and uh, Matthew 25 and that, pan that uh, section in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4. The great cry that goes up here in verse 6 of midnight is surely the shout, which we read of in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. There will be a great shout. And uh, then we which are alive and remain, the last generation will be snatched away to meet the Lord in the air. And yet here in Matthew 25, there's an element of choice. He's come, go to meet him. Well, some delay, others go immediately. Now what's the connection there? Well, I suggest that if we could break down the process into time as we now understand it, there will be the cry made that we have in verse 6, the shout of 1 Thessalonians 4.17, that he's back. Where both wise and foolish know for sure that he is back. But the wise <coughs> choose to go immediately, whereas the foolish delay. Now, what is that sign that there will be, that for sure we know the Lord is back? That without any question, wise and foolish know that the Lord has come back. Well, it could be what the Lord refers to in the Olivet Prophecy when he says that there will be the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, as if there will be a literal sign in the sky and some records of uh, what happened in AD 70 say that there was a similar uh, sign in the, in the stars, like a sword hanging over Jerusalem in the, the final lead up to the uh, destruction of the temple in AD 70. Um, there could be some sign there that is obvious to all. It could be the presence of Elijah. Uh, it seems to me that the, the Elijah ministry is yet to come, maybe for three and a half years. It could be that that Elijah ministry, according to what we read in Revelation 11, has the power to do miracles. So that it's absolutely clear that really this is for real. Uh, it could be that there is active persecution, that there is a tribulation which is of such a nature that it's clear that this is the real thing and the Lord really is about to come. And my suggestion is that those who truly love the Lord, the wise, go immediately. Go to meet the Lord, they go to, to meet him. And that Greek word translated to meet, it does specifically and distinctly mean to go out to welcome a respected visitor. Go out to meet the Lord Jesus. And so they go immediately and they are, we are, confirmed in that by being snatched away, caught up, and we meet the Lord in the air. And in that sense, then, we will come with Jesus to judgment. We're told that the, when the cry goes up in verse 6, then verse 7, all those virgins arose, and that could be a reference to resurrection, it could be a reference to us getting a grip on ourselves spiritually, and they trim their lamps. Now that word trim is the same word translated adorn in Revelation 21 verse 2, where you have the bride of Christ, the wise virgins, again likened to uh, females, uh, adorning themselves, adorned, and coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So, I think that's what's going to happen putting all those scriptures together, that the Lord comes, there is this shout, this cry, this, for sure, both wise and foolish know this is it, the Lord is back. And the wise go out to meet him, that is their gut reaction, great, he's back, hang my, I don't have much oil, hang my, my, my lamp is in a bad state, but he's back, and I want to be with him. And they are confirmed in that desire by being snatched away, to meet the Lord in the air. Well, I can only understand that literally because that whole passage in 1 Thessalonians 4 doesn't seem to me to be using symbolic language. It's a straight up uh, teaching from Paul about what's going to happen to dead people, to dead believers, and why we shouldn't unduly mourn our dead because this is what is going to happen one day when the Lord comes back. Now, that would explain the Lord's reference to how he's going to come and gather together his elect. To gather together his elect. 
as if there is a specific gathering of um, the, the chosen, of, of the righteous. And that would sort of work out, again, by our own choice, that those who want to go with him immediately are confirmed in that and snatched away. And they come with Jesus to uh, Jerusalem in, in judgment. There's a similar sort of idea in Luke 12, verse 36, where the second coming is likened to Jesus knocking on the door, and those who open to him immediately are taken away, are, are accepted. So then, immediate response, that is, that is what is being looked for, and I think that is the, the point of, of the parable, immediate response. That we have nothing in this life, that holds us. We're not like, like Lot's wife, who is, as it were, taken away, but she turns and looks back, missing her, whatever it was, her new kitchen or new car or whatever it was, where her heart was, and zap, she's turned into a pillar of salt, um, she's condemned. If really we, we just are interested in being with the Lord, no matter, we're rich, poor, successful, unsuccessful, pretty, ugly, you know, wealthy, poor, doesn't make a, an issue really, more functional maybe than others or less functional than others. That's not the point. The point is whether in our hearts we so want him and we want to be with him. That's the essence of the whole thing. So then, how exactly the chronology works out is not something that I would get too worried about. I think for sure the meaning of time as we know it has got to change in that uh, period around the Lord's coming. And there are a couple of Old Testament passages which, which seem to hint at that. Although the Hebrew is somewhat obscure, in Zechariah 14, 6 and 7, I'll, I'll read it to you from the uh, AV margin. It shall come to pass in that day that it shall not be clear in some places and dark in other places of the world, but the day shall be one in the knowledge of the Lord, not day nor night. But it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. And the army margin says, renders one of those phrases as, the planets shall contract. And in the Bible, the planets are what control the times and seasons. So we seem to be meeting there the idea of, of a collapse of time as we know it. And talking about judgment, Isaiah 21 verse 12 in the RV has got a similar idea. The morning is come, and also the night. That's why I think all attempts to work out a chronology of events around the, the second coming are kind of doomed to failure, because the meaning of time will be changed. So the whole process of every single one of us coming personally before the Lord and going through things in our lives, you know, when I was hungry, why didn't you feed me? When I was thirsty, well done, you gave me something to drink and some response from each of us, like, Lord, when did I do that? Uh, if we each personally have to come before the Lord and go through our lives, as it were, and there is a judgment process for each person individually, well, if this is going to happen in time as we know it, I mean, this implies a, uh, a huge amount of time. This implies a, 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 a waiting list, as I assume. People lining up. How else are you going to do it? Whereas the whole thing, although it may feel like hours, days, years of discussion with the Lord about our lives, this can happen in a moment. Just in a, in a fraction of a second, or no time at all. Now, if Einstein got it right, as I understand it, and I don't claim to be... Uh, the world's greatest physicist. But as I understand it, if you, if you collapse the dimension of time, you collapse the dimension of space as well. So, therefore, the, the old question of where is this going to happen? Where can all the millions or billions or however many people there are going to be who are going to come to judgment and be rejected or accepted, where is this going to happen? Um, physically, how is it going to work out? But you can forget that one. You can just scribble that problem straight away, because if the, if the meaning of time is changed, then the whole meaning of space is likewise changed. So don't worry about all that, but the whole point is that those who 
are waiting for the Lord the minute they know that he's back. In that split second, we decide our destiny. Do you want to go immediately? He's knocked on the door. Do you want to open immediately or not? Are we going to be like the foolish virgins who, who run off to try to make themselves ready to get oil in their lamps? And then they're delayed and they come and, no, I don't know you. The door is shut. There's something very similar going on here with that passage in the Song of Solomon that you may remember, where the, the girl, the bride, is uh, sleeping at night, and this here in Matthew 25 also happens at night, at midnight. Um, and then she can hear her beloved knocking on the door, and he's trying to get in, and he's out by the windows, and so she goes to, to try to open to him, but it, she delays. She, um, she first of all tries to get herself ready. I mean, there she is, just woken up in the middle of the night, and she starts putting her makeup on. It's really graphic, the description, how she says, my, my fingers, my hands were dripping with uh, myrrh and, and all these cosmetics. And she says she even smeared it over the lock when she went to open. Um, and as I understand it, she's sort of saying, well, then I thought, hang, although I'm not ready, um, okay, I just want to uh, open to him. So she goes there and she fiddles around with a lock with all her makeup dripping over her, her hands, and he's gone. And I, I think this is uh, exactly the uh, picture we've got here, that the beloved comes, and instead of going to open to him immediately, with no, whatever, beauty sleep or whatever, middle of the night, um, absolutely hair all over the place, uh, in, your, in your PJs kind of thing, this, uh, this woman tries to make herself ready. But while she's doing it, then she gets this feeling that, well, anyway, I just want to be with him. But it's too late. He's gone. And she lets herself out of the door, wanders around the streets of Jerusalem, rejected in the middle of the night, gets beaten up uh, by the watchman. And that's a picture of rejection, wandering the streets of Jerusalem in the, in the black, in the dark. So then the whole point is, we cannot make ourselves attractive to him. The whole essence of this thing is that we believe that he loves me. And that is so difficult. He thinks we're great. And we say, nah, you know, nah, I'm not. But all the same, although we are not great, and yes, we are ugly, and yes, it's the middle of the night, and we're sleepy, and all the rest of it, um, that's not the point. He loves me. And this is really where faith comes to its ultimate term. Do we really believe that he will accept me and that I will live eternally in his kingdom? Do I believe that his love for me and his counting of righteousness to me is greater than all my sin, my ugliness, my dysfunction? That's the question. And that is, as I say, I think the ultimate question, really, of, um, of, of, of all of human, human destiny, really. So then, in one sense, this parable applies specifically to the generation that will be alive and remain, as Paul says, at the, at the Lord's coming. And this talk about the wise and the foolish, well, there's another passage that talks about a category of people called the wise in the last day. And that's in Daniel 12. They that be wise turn many to righteousness. Um, the wise will be purified, refined in the time of Jacob's trouble, such as never was. And the wise will shine as the stars for, forever. And yet here, the Lord seems to be saying, yes, but even that category are going to be very, very weak. They all were slumbered and slept. That's fine. And I think that slumbering and sleeping can only be seen in a, in a bad light, particularly when you make the connection with the, the, the verses in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, where it says that the unfaithful in the last days will be surprised by the midnight coming of Christ because they're asleep. Those that are drunk get drunk in the night, like the uh, evil servant who says the Lord delays his coming, so he goes and eats and drinks of the drunken. And of course, the, the way the Lord ends the parable, by saying, look, watch. It can only be read, really, in a bad light. And particularly, what happens after the Lord tells this parable? 
Well, he basically has the Last Supper, um, but, but he, he goes out to uh, Gethsemane after that, and you've got the same thing, that the disciples are told to watch, but they don't. They slumber and they sleep. When he's told them to watch, and he even wakes them up and says, look, I told you not to, not to slumber, but they still do. So I think that we take from that that the generation of the last days, even those who are the wise, even those who shall be faithful, their spirituality is like candles in the wind, very, very weak. And we need to take that seriously, that we believe that we are living in the last days, that we are that last generation that is alive and shall remain until the coming of the Lord. Now, even if you might say, ah, oh, now I think there's more things to be fulfilled in the world yet uh, in terms of prophecy. Remember what I said to start with, that's irrelevant. The point is, we should be living as if the Lord's return is imminent. That we went out to meet the Lord when we were converted to, to him. That we started on a journey to judgment the minute we met him. And Jesus uses that picture elsewhere when he says that we are like someone who is on their way to judgment, and as they're walking along the, the road, they happen to be with uh, someone who has a big case against them. And he says, look, for crying out loud, sort it out with your brother before you get to judgment. So we are on our way to judgment. And that's what happened when we were baptized. We, we started a journey. So then, this oil. In, in a sense, the only difference between the wise and the foolish is that the wise recognize that, well, maybe I don't have enough oil. Maybe my lamp will go out, so I better take some more. So in simplistic terms, you could say that those who will be in the kingdom are those who recognize their failure, their weakness, their liability to fail. And the foolish are the self-confident. Now, ten virgins, each having lamps, might connect with the parable of the ten servants in Luke 19, verse 13, who have talents, who are each given these talents, which I would say is the, uh, the knowledge of God. And so, we have been given the knowledge of God, not, I mean, in an academic, theological kind of sense. There's uh, another insight, I think, into what this oil really is in, uh, in Proverbs chapter 1, where I'm sure the Lord must have had this in mind, in Proverbs 1, 28 and 29, Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall not find me. This is clearly talking about the rejected foolish virgins. They shall call upon me, but I will not answer them. They shall not find me. Why? Because they hated knowledge. For that they hated knowledge. Now, by knowledge, I, I don't mean, you know, academic, intellectual knowledge, of course. Knowledge in the, in the Hebraic sense of that word, uh, in the sense of relationship. And so, the Lord says to the foolish, I don't know you. He doesn't say, you don't know me, so go away. He says, I don't know you. Why? Because they didn't come immediately, because they didn't uh, take oil in their lamps. So then, I think that in our real spirituality, which is related, of course, to God's Word, His oil, His Spirit within us, we reveal ourselves to God. But if our lives had simply been a load of works, a load of talk, and in the deepest inner recess of our hearts, there has not been any real spirituality, then we have nothing to, to show to God. And he doesn't know us. And uh, you know, they say, Lord, Lord, open to us. They, they recognize him as Lord. They're not a bunch of atheists. Lord, open to us. It, it's rather like in a very similar teaching of Jesus in Matthew 7, 22 and 23, where again he, he says, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Those same people are the ones saying, in your name did we not do many wonderful works? So these people did the works and they called Jesus Lord, but he says, I didn't know you. Not you don't know me. He doesn't say, ah, you didn't have enough knowledge. So I'm sorry, but you know, you're not a bad kid, but you didn't have the right knowledge or enough of it, so out, out of here. 
He says, I never knew you. And I think that's a significant difference because what he's saying is the real spirituality is not the works, it's not the mouthing off that I am your Lord, it is deep in your heart having real spirituality, the real fire, the real light, the real oil. That's what he searches for. For example, you can read the Bible and you can amass knowledge. But if we really reflect upon those things, we will come to know him personally. And that is a kind of a mutual thing, that as we know him, so he knows us. There is a mutuality in that sense between the Lord and his people. That we know him, he knows us, as there was between the Father and his Son. Um, you know, in John, a couple of times, the Lord talks about that, about as the Father is growing to know me, and I am growing to know the Father. That is, that's the knowledge of God. And God forbid that we should think that the knowledge of God is a set of theological propositions. That's not at all what it's about. It's no good coming to the Day of Judgment and waving that around. Not at all. We come to the Day of Judgment because we simply want to be with the Lord Jesus immediately. And we love him, and we believe that he loves us. So then, these foolish virgins, they're not completely without oil. In verse 8 in the RV, the foolish say to the wise, give us of your oil, for our lamps are going out. They can see that uh, the light is very, very weak, and very soon it is going out. So then, this is the problem, that we are not atheists, that we recognize Jesus as Lord, we do our wonderful works, but the question is, really, do we know him in that mutual sense? And if we do, then we will, we will want to be with him. We know him, he knows us, he is impatient to see us, and we are longing to see him. Now apparently these lamps, these oil lamps which they used, um, had to be replenished every 15 minutes or else they went out. So you've got the, the, the picture of the, uh, of the wines, sort of dozing off for five or ten minutes, waking up, getting the uh, lamp going again, falling asleep again, jolting back into consciousness, refilling the lamps, etc. Whilst the foolish just snore calmly on. Now, the wines are only relatively wise. They should not have been like this, and the whole crunch point of the parable is there in verse 13. Watch therefore for you don't know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man comes. So, as I say, their faith, our faith, if we really are in this last generation, which we must live, feel, and think as if we are, our faith is as candles in the wind. You, know, you might look at someone and think, wow, she's so strong in her faith. But, you know, even, you know, I say it, the best of us, and none of us are anything, absolutely nothing, all our righteousness is as filthy rags, but the, the, quote, best of us, the strongest of us, are just as candles in the wind. We're slumbering virgins when we should take more seriously what the Lord says in Luke 21, 28, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Why then do the foolish say to the wise, give us of your oil because our lamps are going out? Well, it could just be the furniture of the parable. I wouldn't put too much uh, uh, significance to it, but uh, all the same, why is it there? I think it may be that they then realize uh, I could have been like him, or I could have been like her. Can you share your spirituality with me just in a moment? And of course, it's not possible. And I think that that is one danger of church. It's good, of course, to gather together, to be together, and that is, you know, Christianity is not intended to be lived in splendid isolation, of course. But it is a myth 
to think, oh, we've got such a good speaker coming uh, on Sunday, or going to go away to this uh, Bible weekend, or this uh, whatever it is, because there's this wonderful inspirational speaker, and we think, oh, yeah, yeah, I must go, be encouraged, and all the rest of it. But, in fact, spirituality, by its nature, is, can, is so personal that it cannot be shared. And it's almost bizarre when they say, can you give me some of your oil? Well, no. Um, that's an inappropriate question. And so, whilst we can inspire each other and encourage each other, and uh, there's no doubt about that, in the end, the old thing that our community has kept on coming out with, that it's about personal Bible, reading, prayer, knowing the Lord for yourself, this is absolutely right. Now, in our generation, we are literate people. There's no excuse why not any of us should not be carrying a little pocket Bible with us. If you don't have a pocket Bible, and you really can't get one, send me an email or, or, or ask me. I'll, I'll send you one. That's a promise. We should be in regular contact with the Lord, not just once a day or twice a day. Not rattling off the same old prayers for food and, and that uh, as a kind of conscious salver. Conscience salvo. Now, that is not to say that Bible reading equals spirituality. It is only a, uh, a path, it's only um, the, uh, the journey, not the, uh, not the destination. It's just a tool, it's, it's, not the, uh, it's not the real product. What God is looking for is spirituality, and yes, the Bible is part of that. But it's not the whole picture, and it's certainly not. It's far too simplistic to draw an equation between Bible reading equals oil in my lamp equals spirituality. Not at all. That's not what it's about. It's coming to a position where you love him as a person. Now, the uh, foolish virgins knock on the door. Now, knocking on the door is definitely a figure for prayer. You got that in Matthew 7, verse 7. You know, knock and the door shall be opened in this life. So maybe that speaks of, because I mean knocking on the door is such a common uh, symbol of prayer, a common image for, for prayer. It seems to me therefore that um, maybe they, they pray to Jesus, as it were, for real, for the first time. Now, our relationship with the Lord in this life is going to be continued forever. It's not that we got involved with some uh, Bible study community and we accepted their teachings and we got baptized and we joined them and we're active within the community. That's nothing to do with anything. The real essence is talking to your Lord. And it saddens me and worries me no end. But there has been a teaching within our community and the one hears quite often at times from some, some quarters, that you should not pray to Jesus. I, I, I know, words fail me. God forbid that that mentality leads to this whole situation that there is in, the, in this last day with the foolish virgins knocking on the door, as it were, for the first time. But it's too late. Now is the time to talk to Jesus. Now is the time to have a relationship with him. Now, how do we do that? Do we just walk out of this study saying, ah, oh, yeah, I must have a personal relationship with Jesus? It's not well, like any relationship. It's just not that simple. But certainly talk to him. Read the Gospels daily. Think of how he was. Try to imagine him as a person. It doesn't matter in one sense if you get it slightly wrong. But meditate upon him as a person. Now, stuff like meditation, even Bible reading, prayer, this is all, this is going out of vogue. I don't suppose you could ever do a real meaningful survey where people gave real honest answers on this question, but I just wonder how much prayer goes on, how much talking to Jesus, how much thinking about him, how much Bible reading, and not just reading, but you know, knowledge in the, the sense that I've been talking about, knowledge of him knowing you 
through your knowing of him. I just wonder how much that goes on. But forget about how much it goes on. Is it going on in our personal lives? That is the, uh, that's the question. So then, let us watch and be sober. And, of course, that's repeated really the same when the disciples were in Gethsemane, Matthew 26, 38, watch and pray. So, really watching is not a case of watching world events and uh, trying to tie them up with Bible prophecy. It is being aware of Jesus so that when he comes, we will just want to go and be with him. Great, he's back. The one I prayed for every day. The one I wanted to see. He's back. Great. Oh dear, I'm not as I should be. My, my lamp has gone out. I, or my lamp's in a bad, bad way. Um, I've, um, I've gone to sleep when I shouldn't be. But anyway, he's back. And I just want to be with you. And if I'm no good for you, that's okay. Just get rid of me as quick as possible. Just... Just dissolve me and destroy me and get it over with. I don't want to be existing in any form, in any part of this cosmos, anywhere, in any form, on any uh, level, in any dimension, if I can't please you. Because I love you and you are the love of my life. Now that should be our attitude. I knew an old sister many years ago, and she used to leave out her best clothes every night, and she did this for years, um, with the idea that, well, if Jesus comes, I want to put those on and go to be with him. And I think that's just wonderful. And it's hard to keep that intensity of relationship up, of expectation rather. But it's like any, any relationship, all relationships, including with God, with Jesus, all have a, a way of going uh, stale. But I think that's why the Lord works in our lives. We keep praying that we want a soft life, preserve me from illness, forgive me uh, traveling mercies, may this not happen, may that not happen, may that lump that's appeared not be cancer, may this be okay, may that be okay, etc. And that's understandable. But God and his Son work in our lives to stop the relationship going stale, so that we are put in a situation where we want him and him only, and where we can't wait for his return. Now I want to conclude by maybe apparently contradicting some of the things I've said, but I, I want to focus your attention on the very end verse of the parable, Matthew 25, uh, verse 13. Watch therefore. That's the end of it. Now there is in all the parables what has been called the end stress, that is that the whole point of the story is in the last phrase, in the last sentence, in the, in the final comment of the Lord. And very often he uh, subverts the plot. In other words, that we might be uh, going along there reading the, uh, the, the parable thinking, oh yeah, I understand it, this means that, this means that, and then at the, at the last moment the whole thing is turned back on us. So, we would, I think, expect the story to end with the Lord saying, So therefore, be like the wise virgins and take oil in your lamps. But he doesn't. He says, watch, because you don't know when the Son of Man is coming. When the fact you don't know when the Son of Man is coming may not just be a truism, it may actually be a criticism. In other words, lift up your heads, and you should really be aware that he's coming. You can chew on that as to whether you think that's a, a fair take on that verse or not. But the, the point, I think, is it's not anything to do with how much oil you've got in your lamp. The essence of it all is watch and be ready. And I, I find that quite profound. That the Lord is not saying... Well, the whole point of the story is that you should uh, have oil in your lamps. He doesn't mention that in his end stress, in, in his final comment. He says, so watch, all of you. Be ready for me. 
And I think the, the point almost could be that even the foolish, even if they said, oh, hang, I, I don't have any oil in my lamp. It's gone right out. But he's back. Okay, Lord, I'm, I'm for you. I'm going to go out to meet you. Even if my lamp is out, that's okay. I, so sorry, Lord, my lamp went out. But you're back and I want to go immediately and be with you. So the Lord comes to save his people and that is going to find all of us slumbering. We should not be. None of us should be. And yet, I think the whole end point of the parable is salvation is by grace. It's not as if there were one or two of these wise virgins who didn't go to sleep and who were there with their lights burning and said, okay, Lord, yep, you're back just like we expected, off we go. No, the point is they were all not as they should have been. But the fact that they went immediately, that, I think, is the point. That they believed that his love was greater than their lack of preparedness, their lack of love for him, and all they wanted was to be with him. Now, if you are suffering or struggling in your, in your life, if you've been betrayed by your friends, if you've been left high and dry, emotionally, financially, betrayed by, by the people you trusted, maybe lost your family, you know, in all these things there is the hand of God. Not ruling out human dysfunction and human failure, but in all those things, over and above all that, of who's guilty and who's not guilty, and who was right and who was wrong, and who was wise and who was unwise, over and above all that, that is God's hand. And God is leading, or trying to lead, each of us to a position where there's now only one thing we want, and that is for the cry to come that he is back. Thank you.